So we're very pleased to um, continue with um, our contributed talks for the Friday afternoon session. So our next speaker will be um, Laura um, coleman Jero from um, North Carolina State University. And the title of her talk is Chromatic Symmetric Polynomials and Dick Pass and Q Rook Theory. Thank you for, uh, for the introduction and thank you everyone for being here. I want to present some uh, joint work with Alejandro Morales and Greta Panova. Um, and I kind of like switch it a little bit the way that I usually give this talk or the way I talk about this problem uh, for, for this particular conference. So I hope you, you enjoy a little bit more of the game between algebra and combinatorics. So the first uh, part I kind of like want to talk is about the, the chromatic symmetric functions that appear on the title. And I think this is kind of like a very nice game between combinatorics and algebra. So suppose that we are going to start with some combinatorial object. In this case, we are going to be looking at uh, colorings of graphs. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some notation on, on this slide. So if I have my graph G and I have, I have the set of vertices and edges, I'm going to look at the vertices as an as a order set. I'm going to have V1, V2, up to Vn. Those are going to be my vertices. And I'm also going to have P to be a set of colors. And you know, I'm not going to restrict the, the set of colors so I can have infinite in many colors. And I'm going to label my colors with one, two, three. And in the talk, I will have like labels of the colors, but also um, uh, the, just the colors. So I'm going to look at coloring. So I, each vertex, I'm going to associate a color. And I'm going to say that my coloring is proper if when I have an edge, the two vertices do not have the same color. So this is an example over here. And in this case, the one, two, three, four, and five relates to the, to the labeling of my, uh, of my vertices. And I have like three colors. I have like two red ones. I have two blue ones and a green one. And I can see that if I have two vertices that are uh, attached by a, by an edge, they, they don't have the same color. I don't have a vertex uh, this edge, so there is no problem with these two vertices having blue. Now, one way of looking at this kind of like combinatorial object from an algebraic perspective will be the chromatic symmetry functions. And that's something that is Stanley defined. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take a set of variables and these variables are kind of like gonna encode the colors. And I'm going to look at a monomial x to the k, where this k is kind of like keeping the, the coloring. So I'm looking at the coloring and I'm saying, OK, how many vertices are there of each color? And I'm putting the, the variable corresponding to the color to that exponent. And then I'm going to define a, a symmetric function that says, OK, if I look at all the colorings, I have all the monomials and I add all of them. So in the, in the particular, case of this graph, I will have a monomial that is of the form x1 squared because I have two red ones, x3 squared when I have two blue ones, and x4 to the one because I have a green one. And here you can see that I just gave also to the, like, the colors like a, a number. So there are two things that I'm num numbering uh, at the same time, the vertices and the colors. So just try to be a little bit careful with that. And then kind of like coming back into a more combinatorial setting, I will say, from my perspective, what Saration and Walks did were actually find an assignment of the chromatic functions. And what they did was actually define it with a Q, like a Q analog. So I'm taking Q to be a parameter, and I'm going to be counting the number of percents. So what I'm doing in this case is I'm looking at the vertices. And if I have an edge in my, in my graph and the vertices U is smaller than B, then the colorings are also uh, in increasing order. So if I'm looking at the example that I had before, the one that I have here, I have uh, highlighted in, in yellow, the ones that are counting for the ascent. So for instance, because I'm taking the color red to be one and the color blue to be three, the, this edge over here is gonna be, uh, counted in the number of ascents. The same happens with this one, this one, and I don't have any other. So when I'm, when I'm looking at the monomial now, the monomial is going to have a Q to the three uh, coefficient in that case. So this is kind of like I'm going with a combinatorial object. I'm doing something 
uh, I'm trying to look at it with an algebraic perspective and the refinement is kind of like coming back into the combinatorial object. Now, among all the graphs that we can consider, there are some families that are getting more attention than others. And in, in this case, we also have this combinatorial algebra um, game. So if I were to start, I would say, okay, if I have a graph, I'm gonna be, instead of looking at all the graphs, I'm gonna be looking at those that are coming from dig path. So a dig path is basically, I have a, a, a grid and then by an uh, a square, and I'm having uh, the diagonal over here, and I'm gonna have north and east steps, and I cannot go below the diagonal. So this one over here will be one example of a possible uh, dig path. Now, the dig path turn out to be related. They are in bijection with Heisenberg functions. And the Heisenberg functions here, in the more algebraic setting, they define varieties. So we have Heisenberg varieties. And I, I include here the, the definition of, of a Heisenberg function. Now, from these two objects, both the Heisenberg function and the dig path, we can read the graph. And the way that we are going to be doing that is, well, if I, if I take my set of vertices to be one up to n, I can put them in the diagonal, like I have here, one, two, three, four. And what I'm going to say is I'm going to say that I have a, an edge in my graph, even only if, if I look at this as a coordinate, if this is below the path. So when I'm, I'm, if I'm thinking about uh, atta like attaching, like going from one up to three, I have to go outside the, the path and have to go above the path. So that will, will not be uh, an edge in my vertex. So one, three will not be in my set of vertices. But if I look at, uh, let's say two, three, I'm below, so that one it is. So two, three is gonna be in the set of edges. So this is usually called the indifference graph or the incompatibility one. And in this talk, we are even gonna restrict to a smaller family. And we are gonna restrict to those big paths that are abelian. And the part of abelian is coming actually from the, from the algebraic side, because there are some ideals. If I'm looking at the Heisenberg varieties, I'm gonna have some ideals that are abelian. But in the case of the combinatorial object, what I'm having is that I'm having my dig path to have a first like uh, sequence of north steps. In, the, in this case, I'm gonna have M north steps, and then I have to end with a sequence of east steps, in this case, N. And what I have in the middle turn out to be something that I can encode with a partition. So I have here my, uh, my dig path. It has M north steps at the beginning, and then I have something that fits inside a rectangle. And instead of looking at what is below the dig path, I'm gonna look what is above it over here. And that is gonna define um, a partition. So I can keep track of that partition. And that will kind of like somehow define my, um, my dig path. So what I have this double do lambda here is encoding the, the, the north and east steps that encode this partition here. Okay. So just a little bit of notation and why this family is important or is relevant for us or what we are looking at it. So if I take an abelian path, I can keep the information that is related to the dig path just by remembering N and M. And I'm gonna assume that N is smaller or equal than M with a loss of generality. And I'm gonna encode the partition. So in order to simplify a lot, the notation that I have here, instead of taking the dig path and the graph associated, I'm just gonna put lambda here. And I'm gonna assume that we all have in mind N and N. So what Soration and Walks did, what uh, conjecture was that if I'm looking at this uh, chromatic symmetry function, the Q analog, and I expand them in the E basis, then the coefficients are gonna be in NQ. So what I mean by being in NQ, I mean that there's are gonna be polynomials in Q with non-negative coefficients. And what I'm looking at here is the elementary basis, the elementary symmetry function basis in the ring of symmetry functions. So there are many reasons why these A bases are, are relevant. I, when it comes in terms to positivity, which is what we are looking here with the, with the coefficients, the E basis is the strongest. And um, another reason why I would say that these kind of like problems related to positivity are interesting in the combinatorial perspective could be because having positive coefficients 
means that we can kind of like think about a counting problem. And in the case of the algebra perspective is that they could be counting dimensions or things related to, um, um, to varieties and spacers for which we need them to be positive. Now, uh, when we look at this abelian path, there are some known results from this conjecture. So um, in particular, Cho and Hu prove that there is an, uh, an expansion in terms of the p loss. Uh, Harada and Precap kind of gave, gave a, a, a look and studying these polynomials, the, the symmetry function from the Heisenberg varieties approach, and they have several papers on that. And then I want to focus on two others, which are the Abru Negro and the White Paquette. So Abru Negro, what they did was given a relation of the uh, of um, these symmetric uh, functions in terms of Q Rook and Q Heat theory. And why Paquette did a description in terms of a rectangular basis. So let me let me show you those two identities. Uh, the first one from uh, the GP identity that I'm going to refer is a non-published, some published. So what is what uh, why Paquette proved was that if I have here I have any lambda which is inside a board, so I'm, I'm looking to the chromatic symmetry function associated. The coefficients are some uh, numbers that I have over here, this h, k, lambda, kind of like normalized by this coefficient, so kind of like looking at a probability. And they are also looking at this other, this other uh, symmetry function. So these are what I'm, consider, I'm, I'm calling before a rectangular basis. In this case, what happened is that my lambda or my, my partition is m to the k, which is a rectangle. So what White Paquette, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about his proof, what he did was like kind of like give a basis that is given by uh, rectangular shapes and a study where are the coefficients in that case. So the coefficients here are this ones, but I'm gonna define in a minute. Now Abru Negro, what they did was, okay, if I give expansion in the E basis, they actually saw out that the coefficients that appear here up to some factors are, are also this age uh, are related to the, the same ages that I have here. Just a, a, a notice here in the exponent here, I only have one uh, number while in the, in the upper part here, I have two and that's gonna be relevant at some point. And the other thing that I want to notice is that all the other numbers that appear over here are all Q analogs. So, uh, I didn't, I didn't put the cure just to, to uh, make the notation easier. Okay, so let me give you some definition of those Q, those H numbers. I'm gonna start with looking at the Q root numbers from Garcia and Remo. So what I have here is I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have a shape lambda. I'm gonna draw the diagram and I'm gonna place some rooks. In this case, I'm gonna place K rooks in there. So the condition over here to place the rows is this excess that I have here is that I can only have one, at most one per uh, row and column. So in this case, I'm putting four in a shape that is 9833. And then I'm going to do some kind of like attacking. And the attacking that I'm going to be doing, I'm, I have it here, is going to be west and south. So the, the rays that I have over here, I kind of like attacking some of the boxes. And what I'm gonna be counting in, uh, in this uh, statistics are actually the ones that are not attacking. So the ones that I have with the dots here. And I'm gonna keep track that with, a, with an exponent with Q. So those are called the Q root numbers. And there is actually a general, like a, another basis that we could consider if we were thinking about this as basis that is called the Q-hit numbers. So we could define them with this super complicated formula in which again, all the numbers are Q analogs. And here I have my Q root numbers, but I'm actually interested more in, can I read those Q-hit numbers from the, um, from the lambda, from the shape and the attackians? And the idea is that, yes, we can do that. So uh, here's our definition. And I will talk about this other side on, um, in a minute. So what happens here is that what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, instead of just considering the shape lambda, 
I'm gonna be looking at my rectangle here. And this is where the M and N that I have on the coefficients are playing a role. And if I only have one of them, that means that I'm considering a square instead of a rectangle. Now, I'm going to place one rook for each row, it, uh, for each uh, row, I guess, like I have here. And my condition with the K is that I'm going to be looking at having K inside lambda. So I have, in total, I'm going to have N rook placements, and K of them has to be inside the lambda. So here I have N equals 6, K equals 2, and those are the two that I have inside. Now, my attacking, my attack now to the other boxes are going to go from um, in the following way. So it's south and east, but the east side, I'm looking at it as a cylinder. So I'm going all the way south in all the cases, like I have here. And now when I have to go east, I'm going to be thinking about the partition to be a limit. So like a boundary, like I have here. But if I'm on the, I'm outside the rectangle, uh, the, the shape lambda, and I'm going to the other side of the rectangle, I think about it as a cylinder. So I will continue until I touch the side of the, um, of the partition. And what I'm gonna be counting is I'm gonna be counting the number of boxes that I'm gonna attack. So in this case, we have a total of 13. Now, uh, you can see that I, when I defined the Q root numbers, I was using west and south. And now that I'm defining the, um, the heat numbers, I'm using the south and east. So there are some controversy when it comes to uh, which direction should we be using. So for square boards, there are currently like two versions of it. One is using south and east, the other one is using north and west. And there are some equivalences that we can consider. But one has to be careful just when uh, we are looking at those two. So uh, if there are going to be some identities in the talk, and I'm going to denote them when I'm using this other version with that tilde, because it's one that appears on, on the literature. And I want to notice that they differ by a power of Q. However, the fact that they differ by a power of Q is actually kind of like complicated at some point. Or it's making things a little bit more complicated. And let me, let me give you uh, an idea of why. So one of the nice properties that we have when we look at graphs is that we have deletion and contraction of graphs. So I can either delete a vertex and delete all the, all the edges, or I can contract everything. So when it comes to having a partition and I look at a corner box, I can either delete the box or I can delete both the row and the column. So in this case, with this, this two actions that I can do in the, uh, in the partitions, the Q rooks behave very well. Because like, if I have I rooks on lambda, this is gonna be the same that like adding the, the rooks when I'm deleting the edge multiplied by a Q factor, or I can contract the edge and then consider a smaller number of uh, rooks. Now, when we try to translate this deletion contraction formulas into the Q hint numbers, what happens is that we got a very nice uh, relation when it comes to the H, lamb, uh, H tilde. So these are the ones that the work can consider and are the ones that uh, are different from our uh, approach. For ours, we got a conjecture. So um, we haven't been able to give a, a proof of this one. We do have some enough computations to believe that is true. This will be uh, an open problem, but we haven't been able to give a, a description or, or a combinatorial explanation why this is true. Now, now that I have introduced the, the coefficients, let me go back to the two identities that we have. So for Y packet identity, what happens is that we remember that we have this, uh, this set of like this family of uh, partitions that are given by rectangles. And here I have what the coefficients. So the proof that uh, Waipake uh, gave, or at least the one that we have seen in his notes, is that he saw that these are, this, like if I'm looking at this family, I'm actually having a basis. And then he studied their dual to figure out what are these coefficients. And that's how he obtained this proof. So it's very algebraic, really based on linear algebra. Now, if we look at the reference of Abru Negro with the other identity, they actually did a very nice proof characterizing the functions uniquely using a list of properties. 
And I want to kind of like give you an idea of the, of the properties. So these, if, if they look at this description, this is the unique function such that they are multiplicative. So if I'm looking at, two, uh, at the union of two graphs, this is a disjoint union of graph, I'm actually multiplying uh, the, the functions. They do have the correct value for the complete graph. And that is in terms of the is n factorial, the elementary symmetry function. And they also satisfy a modular law, which is basically there is like there are three graphs over here, but they, there is a relation of obtaining two of them used in the, the, the first one. So if I get G0, the idea is to add one vertex or delete a, a vertex. So these, these graphs over here are actually related, they are not generic. So the proof is used in this. So what I, I just want to give like uh, an idea of what we did. So what we did was actually giving uh, a new proof for GP identity using QRook and QHIT theory. And we also saw that these two identities are equivalent. And we did that all of that using the, the QHIT numbers and the QRook numbers. So in our, in our proof, we also had to prove several relations for the QHIT numbers. And we also find some new problems to work on. For instance, the conjecture that I gave you before. Uh, and among those, like, I think I have one minute left. So I just want to kind of like say that in our proofs, like we have a lot of combinatorial arguments, but we are missing somehow a lot of objective proofs. For instance, one can relate the GP identity by looking at colorings and group placements, or one can think about these two results that are both of them ES functions and one uses P tablets and the other one QHIT numbers. And, one should be able to give a projective proof between these two objects. And that is something that we have been looking at, but we haven't been able to find. The other one would be to kind of like look at the sure expansion of the, of the chromatic symmetry function and try to give a, a proof, like reprove the result using the modular characterization that Abronigro gave. And our paper has a, a few other QHIT relations and identities that we have found com more, mostly computationally with their computer, but we haven't been able to prove. And that's all I wanted to share with you. Well, thanks for a very nice talk. So let's thank the speaker. And then um, if there's questions, if people want to unmute and ask or um, ask in the chat, I think there was one question in the chat during the lecture. So Laura, have you, this is Francois Bergeron, have yeah. you considered the similar problem with uh, instead of uh, classical big paths, but those th that fit inside the rectangle? No, we haven't. And I do okay. want to try it, <laughs> so. Okay. I think it, it will be interesting. And I think that, uh, um, Alan, I think that just, uh, when, uh, Alan asked a question that uh, if abelian means that the algebra of matrices is commutative, yes. I also had a question. Hi, Laura, this is Bruce. Um, so, of course, the Sureshian wax conjecture is a refinement of the Stanley Stembridge conjecture. And mm -hmm. one of the uh, ways people have tried to attack the Stanley Stembridge conjecture is rather than looking at functions, symmetric functions, looking at functions in non commuting variables. So, and when you do that, the advantage is that you get a deletion contraction law for graphs, just like you would for the chromatic polynomial. How much of the story that you've been talking about has been investigated for symmetric functions in non-commuting variables? As far as I know, not much. Okay. If, it might be a useful... I know there has been, I mean, people have been looking at other graphs, like uh, with cyclic orientation, something like that, but I haven't seen many results on non commutative variables. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Great talk, by the way. Thank you. I also want to say that uh, this is a topic in which we do have a lot of problems to communicate, especially the algebraic community with the combinatorial community. So, anyone interested in helping both of us? <laughs> <laughs> it's really good because um, when I read some of the papers on the Heisenberg varieties approach, I'm completely lost. And I know that some of the researchers in that uh, area of expertise are also lost when they read us. 
our papers. So um, being able to communicate will be amazing. Very good. So let's thank the speaker uh, once more. There's one more question in the chat, but I propose since we're going to the virtual coffee break that uh, perhaps we can you can pursue the those discussions uh, at the informal coffee break. So let's thank the speaker one more time. And um, so we'll resume with the next contributed talk at 3.50 and we'll just leave the, the Zoom uh, open for, for people to socialize um, as they would like. So thanks. Hmm. <clears throat>